So welcome to our next session, which is partial multi-tenancy with Strimsy. And we've got Colt McNeely here to talk about that. So throughout this session, if you have any questions, then please use the Q&A in Bevy. And at the end of the session, I'll pop up and ask any of those questions to Colt as well. So with that, I'll hand over to you. All right, well, um, thanks for taking the time to join and I appreciate the introduction, Kate. Um, great to be here. I'm a huge fan of Shrimzy. It's been absolutely fantastic to use it. And today we're gonna talk a little bit about how we use it at Little Horse. Um, so uh, first we're gonna uh, use a case study. We're going to talk about how at Little Horse Cloud we're going to use Shrimzy and why. We're not gonna spend too much time on that, but we're gonna get into some really cool details about how you can use Shrimzy to help with things like topic management, encryption, access control, uh, quota enforcement, and day two operations. So uh, to quote Anakin Skywalker, we're going to bring peace, freedom, justice, and security to our shared Kafka cluster. And then we're also going to bring balance to the force. So uh, topic management gives you the freedom to create topics for different teams. Uh, encryption gives you security. Access control gives you justice to make sure that no one reads data that they shouldn't read. Um, noisy neighbors, so quota enforcement gives you peace and cluster balancing brings balance to the force. So that's the theme of, of today's topic uh, is, is how you can use Strimzy to accomplish these goals. So to start, uh, we're going to use Little Horse as a case study. This is not a presentation about Little Horse, so I'm only gonna spend 30 seconds on it, but Little Horse is a workflow engine for coordinating microservices. It's very up and coming, we're a new startup. The idea is to make it easier to coordinate transactions across different microservices. It's kind of a, a, a smart message router between services or a central nervous system between your software applications. And one thing about Little Horse is that the Little Horse server requires Kafka in order to run, which makes it actually a really interesting case study for, for Strimzy because we want to run many different Little Horse clusters uh, because we're gonna have many different customers and we're going to need to be able to uh, enforce, uh, do that in a secure manner. So we're going to talk today about how Little Horse uses Strimzy to safely share a, a Kafka cluster uh, inside our walls across many different Little Horse servers. So uh, we have various flavors of Little Horse Cloud, where Little Horse Cloud is a cloud service where our customers can access Little Horse. And one of those flavors is called Little Horse Cloud Enterprise, in which case you uh, are given a, a your own private dedicated Little Horse server, but it's in a shared Kubernetes environment. So the way that would look from the client perspective of Little Horse is a client would be given a URL and they connect to their own Little Horse cluster and those Little Horse clusters sit in one giant Kubernetes cluster, right? But where does Kafka come into play? As I said earlier, under the hood, Little Horse uses Kafka. So each Little Horse cluster could have its own Kafka cluster, of course, managed by Strimzy, that it uses to persist its data and, and as its com uh, commit log and, and write ahead log, right? So we looked at this architecture for Little Horse Cloud Enterprise and it has its advantages and its drawbacks, but there's another one. There's another potential architecture, which is this, where all the Little Horse clusters end up sharing the same shared Kafka cluster. And there's a couple of trade-offs here. The first one being uh, ease of use and the second one being security and, um, also uh, the noisy neighbor problem, right? So when you have a, a shared Kafka cluster, there's a lot of problems that you might run into. For example, if uh, cluster one or client one starts sending a lot of traffic, we don't want that to cause unavailability or increased latency for, for the yellow or the green clients. Um, additionally, if, uh, we, additionally, security is very important to us. So we want to ensure minimal, we want to ensure the principle of least privilege and defense in depth is respected. So obviously we don't plan for anyone to be able to get remote code execution access to any of these little horse clusters, but these clusters are going to be exposed to the internet. So as a second layer of security, we don't want anyone who has access to run code on these servers to be able to read topics or write to topics that they shouldn't have access to. So we want to enforce the principle of, of least privilege uh, and we want to maximize security. We want to ensure that all traffic is encrypted. And that's actually a little bit tricky to do with just plain old Apache Kafka. So uh, that said, why do we want to share Kafka among all of our Little Horse clusters? And the, the biggest one is resource utilization, uh, which is if we have three customers, three Little Horse servers, and one of them is, and, and they might have small loads, deploying 
um, deploying a Kafka cluster with three, three controllers, three brokers for each single Little Horse server, Little Horse installation, would get a little bit expensive because JVMs have overhead. Then also we would have to end up deploying the uh, entity operator and the cruise control operator. We'd have to have more Prometheus scraping targets. So it also would increase the operational hassle just a little bit. If we had to share, uh, it, but if we can share Kafka, we can reduce that burden um, as we add more little horse clusters. So uh, that said, as I said before, we have a bunch of requirements. We have to create topics for every single little horse uh, server installation when a new customer gets onboarded. We have to have full encryption of all, all network traffic that goes around Kafka. We have to enforce the principle of least privilege and we have to isolate the, uh, the tenants, the tenants being the little horse servers um, at the performance level. And lastly, we need to make sure that our SRE team doesn't have headaches uh, in operations. So um, I'm gonna start with topic management, right? So uh, every single Little Horse server needs a, its own set of topics and how it uses it is, is beyond the scope of this presentation. However, we need to create topics every time we create a new Little Horse cluster or Little Horse installation. So one way you can do that is with the Kafka command line uh, utility, right? And that's great. It's it's great for prototyping. I've, I've done it a couple of times. Um, the problem with that is if you have a bunch of different Kubernetes clusters in different regions and many little horse installations in each cluster, it becomes very hard to manage it manually. And in fact, it's it's not, not a good idea because you're going to have human error. There's going to be copy and paste error. Additionally, managing the authentication to do it in a secure manner is, is quite difficult. And there's no way to enforce any sort of standardization, right? So. Of course, this is a conference about Strimzy and how you can use Kubernetes operators to make operations a lot more simple, right? So we don't wanna be doing this, but thankfully Strimzy is fantastic and there's this Kafka topic custom resource definition. So we all know what a custom resource is in, in, in Kubernetes because this is a, a, a Kafka operator uh, conference. So the, the Kafka topic CRD is a custom resource definition that allows you to create Kafka topics on the fly using Kubernetes manifests. So the Kafka topic uh, CRD has a reference to a Kafka cluster uh, implemented via a label, and it implements one-way reconciliation. So fun fact, there's actually in the other room right now um, a, a conference going on about the implementation of the one-way unidirectional Kafka topic operator. Uh, in the past, it used to be two-way reconciliation. Now it's one-way. And what does that mean? That means that if you declare some certain specifications for the Kafka topic on your Kafka topic custom resource, the Kafka topic operator will ensure that the, the actual topic on your Kafka cluster matches that configuration at any point. So for example, if you set the replication factor of your topic to three in your Kafka topic custom resource, and then someone comes along using the CLI and updates it to five replication, rep replication factor of five or replication factor of two, for example, the Kafka topic operator or the, the entity operator will recognize that and force the reconciliation back or force the topic back. To, to match what you've specified in your Kafka topic custom resource. So here's an example of a, of, of a Kafka topic uh, custom resource. You can see it points to a Kafka cluster and you can configure some uh, configurations on the topic here. So this is a simple one. All we do is we set the number of partitions and the number of replicas. You can also pass in configurations such as the cleanup policy, retention policy. Uh, there is a session later today about tiered storage and I'm very much looking forward to how that will work with the, the Kafka topic custom resource. But anyways, uh, the fact that we now have it in a YAML file that is reconciled by Kubernetes solves the problem of how you can, in a standardized manner, create these Kafka topics in your organization. So one simple workflow that you can use is to make a Git push with that Kafka topic uh, YAML in a, in a repository and then have Argo CD deploy that Kafka topic custom resource to Kubernetes, and then Strimzy will reconcile the topic into your Kafka cluster. And this is fantastic, it works very well. There's some other ways to do it when you have larger number of teams and you want to enable more self-service, perhaps without your, your team members having to understand everything about Kubernetes, or if you want to expose, uh, if you want to use different access control levels inside your organization, we can discuss that at the end, perhaps if we have time. Um, so, we have discussed how we are going to give teams freedom to create uh, Kafka 
topics uh, as, as we add new, uh, new, as we onboard no, new tenants into our clusters. So in the case of Little Horse Cloud, onboarding a new tenant into our cluster means we have a new customer, which means we're creating a new Little Horse cluster. But in your case, if you're not running a past service, onboarding a new team would mean, you know, a, a new team of microservice developers needs to use Kafka for, for some things internally. Next thing I want to talk about is encryption and access control. And I'm going to kind of move them together and, and, put, and talk about them both together because there's one custom resource that kind of helps solve both of them at the same time. So first of all, what do we need to encrypt? So a little bit about Kafka is it's a distributed system and there are many different servers. So in this picture, I have two brokers. Um, in a real cluster, there's brokers and controllers and generally they are hopefully on separate machines and the controllers and the brokers all need to talk to each other. And they do this for replicating data, uh, for propagating metadata as well. Um, so that's the blue arrows that we see right here is the, the intra cluster traffic uh, for the Kafka cluster. We need to encrypt that. Additionally, Strimzy needs to talk to Kafka, right? Uh, Strimzy is, um, it, it needs to talk to Kafka in order to do things like determine who, which controller is the uh, current leader so that it, it doesn't, uh, it, for example, in the Kafka roller talk, which we saw earlier today, so that we don't roll the leader over and over and over again, it needs to do things like um, reconcile Kafka topics, which we just talked about. So because of that, Strimzy needs to talk to the Kafka, uh, Kafka brokers themselves. And lastly, our tenants, which is the Little Horse clusters, the Little Horse servers, need to be able to talk to the brokers. So we have three types of traffic we need to encrypt. Um, and when you think of encryption, you know, I first thought of OpenSSL, right? Uh, and this looks fun, uh, especially at scale when you have dozens of Kafka clusters and many in dozens of Kubernetes clusters and many different um, tenants of each Kafka cluster. So we don't really want to do that. Thankfully, Strimzy is amazing, and it does two of these three things for us out of the box, which is Strimzy will just transparently encrypt all traffic from the operator to the brokers, and it will also configure the brokers to uh, communicate with each other in an encrypted manner. Now, a small note, I, I didn't put this on the slide because it would become quickly outdated, which is that if you run Kafka with Zookeeper mode as well, the communication between Strimzy and Zookeeper and also between the brokers and Zookeeper is automatically encrypted, which is fantastic. Uh, the reason why I'm not really spending too much time on that is because uh, Kafka 4.0 is a couple months around the corner. Um, maybe there might be a 3.8 release, I think. Uh, but in 4.0, uh, Kafka with Zookeeper is no longer going to be a thing. So uh, for now, we don't need to worry about Zookeeper. And in Little Horse Cloud, we're just going straight to craft mode. Um, so at this point, we have uh, encrypted traffic. Well, uh, Strimzy has encrypted for us the traffic between the operator and the, the Strimzy operator and the Kafka cluster, and also between the brokers themselves. However, there's one more thing we need to encrypt. We need to encrypt the traffic between Little Horse and Kafka. And we also need to simultaneously give each client, which is the Little Horse cluster, an identity so that it can securely access Kafka and that Kafka can, can control what topics it can read to. So we're going to do both of that using both of those things using the Kafka principles concept, right? And we could create principles using the command line. Um, and we know again that, you know, the command line isn't really compatible with the whole GitOps movement or uh, Kubernetes native development. Uh, it's, it's very difficult, error prone, and we really don't want to take risks of having human error cause a security incident. So uh, we don't really want to do this, but thankfully, uh, Strimzy comes to the rescue with the Kafka user custom resource. And this is a fantastic, uh, fantastic tool that, that Strimzy gives us, which is deployed as part of the entity operator, which um, allows you to create Kafka principles uh, and manage them using a custom resource file as well. So this is the first part of a Kafka user custom resource, and let's take a look at it. So once again, we reference a Strimzy cluster, and this is the, the name of the Kafka custom resource that we want to create the Kafka user on. Um, and what we want to do right here is we want to create uh, a Kafka principle that can be authenticated via TLS. So just as a refresher, in, in Kafka, there's various different ways to identify a client. So if you have a plain text listener, I think you can set the client ID and that determines the, the principle. Uh, that might be wrong, so fact check me, please. But you can also use uh, uh, SASL 
in order to determine the, the um, identity. And then in this case, we're using TLS or MTLS in order to authenticate the client to the uh, Kafka cluster. And in this case, TLS is used for both, uh, TLS is used to determine identity. And we'll see later how you can use the Kafka user custom resource in order to um, enforce access control on top of that identity once the identity is established for the communication with the cluster. So um, the once again, we have gotten to the point where you can apply Kubernetes YAML to GitHub or Bitbucket and then have some uh, GitOps tools such as Argo CD or perhaps Flux uh, create a custom resource in Kubernetes, which Strimzy will reconcile in order to configure the state of your Kafka cluster. So we can now manage topics and clients for Kafka. But how does this actually work? Um, in uh, how does this actually work, right? So when I pass the or when when the the Kafka user CRD gets created, the Strimzy Kafka uh, Kafka user operator will do two things. First, it will create a, a principal and configure ACLs on the broker side for it. And then secondly, it will create a Kubernetes secret, which has TLS certificates on it, and it will keep that secret up to date so that the Little Horse clusters, Little Horse servers can just mount that secret as a volume on the pod and use that pod to encrypt their, their communications with the, with the uh, Kafka cluster. So this is fantastic. We have now solved the problem of encryption for uh, both for all three uh, P, uh, layers of traffic. We have the Kafka, the Strimzy cluster operator is speaking with the Kafka cluster in an encrypted manner. The Kafka brokers are talking to each other with an encrypted manner, and that's all thanks to Strimzy out of the box. And then with just a little bit of work, we can use the Kafka user CRD to give ourselves certificates so that the little horse clusters can communicate with the Kafka brokers in a secure manner. <clears throat> so um, that still leaves one thing, which is, I said earlier, we want to enforce the principle of least privilege, and we, we want to make sure that each little horse cluster can only see what it absolutely needs to see. And maybe in our case, this isn't absolutely critical because the little horse servers are code that we own and we control, and it's only one team managing all of them. However, in a larger enterprise uh, or uh, in, a, in an environment where different teams are running different environments, where different teams are running different microservices, it is absolutely critical sometimes to enforce access control so that each um, each team can only <clears throat> access data that they really need to access. So Kafka has ACLs, access control lists. That's different from role-based authentication. So um, quick tangent on what is role-based authentication. Uh, I don't want to go too deep into this, but role-based authentication is where you define a role and a role has certain capabilities. For example, a role could access uh, topic A with the read ACL, and it could access topic B with the write ACL. Um, and then different clients can assume that role. So you can have 10 different clients that all assume one role, and, and a client can have multiple roles, and the, the permissions are additive. Kafka's um, access control model is a little bit more simple, where you basically just have a client, and the client has permissions directly. Um, and there's two types of uh, ACLs in Kafka. You can give an ACL that uh, applies to a specific resource, so a specific topic or a specific consumer group or a specific transactional ID, for example. Or you can give an ACL that applies to all resources with a certain prefix. And if you look in the Kafka documentation, they describe the prefix-based ACLs as a way to enable some form of multi-tenancy. And the, the title of this presentation is Partial Multi-Tenancy on Kafka, not Full Multi-Tenancy. And the reason why it's Partial Multi-Tenancy is because of two things. Number one is that the users of the Kafka cluster are all in the same organization, so they're somewhat trusted. There's a certain level of trust there. They're not completely adversarial. And the second is that the isolation mechanism is has a prefix on it. So um, there are other uh, forks of Kafka. One of them is a very big company, uh, probably the most well-known company that provides a cloud service for Kafka. And one of their cloud service uh, offerings is actually fully multi-tenant, where you are given a URL, a bootstrap server URL, and a, a, a principal, and it appears to you that you can you have full access to a Kafka cluster, but really under the hood, there's many people using the same physical servers. That is full multi-tenancy. It's not available in, in Apache Kafka, unfortunately. So the best we can do is use prefixes. So in the Little Horse Cloud case, what we do is we give each Little Horse cluster, which is our tenant, a prefix that isolates it. And what we do is our little our Kubernetes operator that runs Little Horse 
will create a bunch of Kafka topic resources. And uh, the, the prefix is just the name of the Little Horse cluster uh, for, uh, for reference into how we do it. So here's how that looks on the Kafka user CRD. Uh, this is the continuation of the previous screenshot of the Kafka user CRD from a couple slides ago. You can see there's an authorization section and we can add ACLs to these uh, Kafka users. So for example, this particular Kafka user has the ability to describe, describe the configs of, write and read and do any cluster actions on any Kafka topic with the, wh whose name starts with LH cluster dash LH Kafka. And this is the prefix, right? And additionally, uh, we have configured here that it can do anything, it can do any operation on a consumer group with that prefix and it can do any operation on a transactional ID with that prefix. And, and that's needed because the application that we use uh, uses Kafka transactions quite, quite extensively. So obviously we need the ability to uh, control, we need, we need, that's why we need item potent right and the uh, transactional ID ACLs. So um, there's a couple other streams of features uh, in the Kafka user CRD, which I should mention, I'm not gonna go into detail on. One of them is uh, that you can create uh, Kafka users with different auth authentication types. So the one I showed uses authentication type of TLS. And there's the other option is uh, SASL SSL, uh, which uses the Scramshaw 512 implementation and it creates like a user and a password. Um, and uh, uh, just as how StreamC's Kafka user CRD generates a secret with TLS certificates, if you set the authentication mode to TLS, it will also create a secret with a user and a password and, and a SASL JAS config for you uh, if you uh, set the, the mode to, to this. And, and there's also um, an OAuth plugin, which allows you to use Keycloak as, as the identity provider. And uh, it's quite cool. Um, but unfortunately, because we don't have time, uh, we, we won't go into it. And it turns out that you know, we, we decided that it didn't make sense to use those two things for Little Horse Cloud and that TLS was the simplest one for our use case. So um, we have brought um, uh, freedom, justice, and security to our uh, shared Kafka cluster. Freedom being topic creation, justice being uh, ACLs that control who can do what, and security being encryption. Now we need to bring peace. We need to solve the noisy neighbor problem. Um, and that's very important for us. I think the, the um, ACLs are, are important, but that's just for a very bad disaster scenario, in which case someone has hacked one of the Little Horse servers, which is very unlikely. Uh, but the noisy neighbor problem is very crucial for us. Uh, and this is uh, if we have three Little Horse um, users or three, three Little Horse customers, three Little Horse servers, and one of them starts sending way too much traffic, we, um, the, the Little Horse servers are using a shared Kafka cluster. And if that Kafka cluster gets overloaded, the other two users will notice that and their, their latencies will start to spike, which we really, 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 really don't want, right? So thankfully, uh, Kafka has some, some quotas features, and these quotas are, are quite useful for what we're trying to do here, which is to actually limit the ability of one uh, user or one, one, uh, one client, one customer, one Little Horse cluster to overload the Kafka cluster. So once again, we're continuing building the same Kafka user custom resource specification that we started a long time ago. This is another section of the same custom resource. We can see here we have configured a uh, an amount of bytes per second that a, the Kafka consumers, for any Kafka consumer with this client ID or the, this principal ID can consume per second and how much they can produce per second. Now, uh, I do need to, to uh, make a comment on how Apache Kafka works on quotas. Uh, Apache Kafka, as we said earlier, is a distributed system, which means that there are many different brokers that the data is scattered across. and uh, when producing to a topic, especially if you're using a Kafka streams application, which partitions things by keys, most requests go to a bunch of different brokers. And, and that means every client has to talk to every broker pretty much. Um, and the quotas are on a per broker basis rather than a per cluster basis. The reason for that is that it is very hard in a distributed system to coordinate cluster wide quotas, very, very hard because uh, the brokers would have to talk to each other about how much each client had consumed at, the, at, at, a, at a certain amount of time, right? So um, that means that the, the Apache Kafka quotas are on a per broker basis, which means that if you look back here, 
this Kafka user can produce this number of uh, can produce this number of bytes per second to one specific broker to each specific broker. So if there's ten brokers, the actual quota is ten times this. If there's one broker, this is the actual quota. And it turns out that our customers don't really care how many Kafka brokers there are in our customer in our in our cluster. If they ask for like one gigabyte per second of throughput, they want one gigabyte per second of throughput. We don't they don't really care how many Kafka brokers there are, right? Um, so what we need to do is we need to figure out a way to use the Kafka quotas that come in Apache Kafka in order to give our customers the ability to, uh, you know, give our customers a, a quota that makes sense for them. Or, or and in your case, in, in the case of, you know, running Kafka at an enterprise, each different microservice would need to have its own set of quotas as well, right? So this, this applies equally in, in the enterprise um, scenario. So what we have done is there's an approximation you can do. The, the per broker quota uh, can be approximated as the cluster quota divided by the number of brokers. So the cluster quota being, for example, the, the customer pays for a little horse cluster that needs to be able to run one gigabyte per second of data through Kafka, right? So the produce quota would be one gigabyte per second divided by however many brokers we have. So if we have 10 brokers, the per broker quota would be 100 megabytes. If we have 20, then it would be 50 megabytes. And then, of course, we would have to add padding because if we promise our customers something, we need to make sure that we're you know, exceeding that, that SLA, right? However, if you've been paying attention, um, there is a problem. Um, the problem is balance. So we're going to bring balance to the force. Um, the problem of balance will become apparent when you consider what happens as you add more and more and more uh, customers onto your, to your uh, more tenants onto your Kafka cluster. So... Let's start with an oversimplified scenario uh, where we have one broker um, and we have two little horse uh, servers using the same broker. And, um, you know, in real life, we would have replication. So we'd have at least three brokers and uh, we'd have a lot more than just four partitions for a little horse cluster. Uh, but for the sake of argument, let's just say that one broker can handle at max, you know, two little horse server installations on it. Um, in real life, it could handle a little bit more. But um, so now if we want to add a new customer, uh, we can't fit it onto the same broker. So we need to add another broker. And then the naive way of doing that is like this. However, now we have a problem, which is let's just say that each customer wants to have a one gigabyte per second quota of uh, produced throughput, right? The way we calculated it two slides ago would be, in this case, the uh, per broker th uh, quota would be, uh, well, I mean, one, one gigabyte per second is quite high, but per broker quota would be 500 megabytes per second. And that's a problem because the red cluster, as you see here, all four partitions for that cluster are on the same broker. So the red cluster will only be talking to one broker at a time, which means that the effective cluster-wide quota is 500, not one gigabyte, uh, which is bad because now we're under-promising, we're under-delivering on what we promised. So what we actually want is we want to properly spread the, uh, the, the replicas across all the brokers, all right? And if only there was a way that we could do that. Uh, and of course, because StreamZ has thought of basically everything that you would need to think of for, for Kafka, there's so many cool things that, that we're uh, trying to, you know, we, that we need to take advantage of, that we already take advantage of, that we just don't have time to talk about today, like Mirror Maker, Kafka Connect. Uh, it's, like, StreamZ literally thinks about everything. It's awesome. So they, there's this open source project um, that will help us bring balance to the Kafka cluster or bring balance to the force, which is the last phase in Anakin Skywalker's uh, life. Um, so there's this open source project called um, Cruise Control, and there's also the, uh, I forgot, that there, there's also a command line utility called Kafka Reassign Partitions.sh, which allows you to reassign partitions manually and basically tell the Kafka cluster what partition should have what, uh, or what broker should have what partitions on it, right? And obviously that's really, really hard to do, uh, but there is um, a much better way to do it using StreamZ. Um, there's an open source project that came out of LinkedIn called Cruise Control which is basically um, a, a system that sits there and allows you and, and, and um, sits there and you give it a bunch of optimization goals and it will do its best to rebalance your Kafka cluster in order to match those, those uh, goals. It also does a lot of fancy monitoring um, out of the, the scope of today's discussion, but uh, StreamZ makes it incredibly easy to use cruise control uh, through native custom resources and it, the, the Kafka CRD, uh, the, the StreamZ Kafka CRD uh, has a native 
way to deploy cruise control and configure it to securely access your Kafka cluster with encryption, which is fantastic. Um, and then the Kafka rebalance CRD allows you to use cruise control to rebalance your cluster without having any, any idea at all how cruise control works. So um, basically what you can do with the Kafka rebalance is point it to your Kafka cluster, just like the Kafka user and Kafka topic CRDs, and then pass in a list of goals, right? Um, so in this case, I passed in a bunch of goals. And one of the goals that we had before was we want to evenly distribute the replicas for a topic across all of the cluster in order to make sure all the brokers in the, in the cluster, in order to make sure that our uh, a quota approximation for the cluster-wide quota is actually respected uh, and is, is actually accurate, right? And then these are a bunch of other goals that, that are the hard goals that are by default required for, for rebalance in order to make sure that the cluster is generally healthy. Like for example, we don't want any one broker to be overloaded too much. And we also want to make sure that we have replicas for every single partition in different availability zones. So if, if we have a, a zone-wide failure, we can still continue processing. So how does it work? What we do first is we apply the Kafka rebalance custom resource when, for example, we add a broker. And then we wait a little bit, and then cruise control will think, and it does a lot of linear programming or something like that, and then comes up with a proposal. And the proposal, it looks something like this. This is kubectl described Kafka rebalance. Um, the pro proposal will tell you how much data is going to be moved, uh, how many replicas are going to be moved inside a broker, how many leaders are going to change, how many replicas are going to move overall, and overall how balanced the cluster is before and after. So sometimes it might do something crazy and you realize, oh, it's going to move too many megabytes of data at one point. Um, and it, it's like a, it's a dangerous thing that you don't actually want to do. So you have the option to approve or reject the, the proposal, right? In this case, the proposal looks reasonable. Uh, so we're going to approve this proposal. Now there's two other points I'd like to make, uh, which is one, you know, perhaps and manually approving and uh, manually annotating the Kafka rebalance to approve it might be a step that you don't want to do. So you can configure the Kafka rebalance to automatically be approved. Um, that's one thing you can do. And the second point is there's a lot of configurations on cruise control that uh, Strimzy has pretty sensible defaults for, uh, which allow you to tune exactly how fast the rebalance happens because there's the number of ongoing replicas that are moving at any given point in a, in a batch of the rebalance. And then also you can configure the uh, amount of bytes per second that are sent as part of the rebalance process. And there's this trade-off between how fast you want the rebalance to occur and also um, how disruptive you want to be. So for example, if, if you have no quotas and, and you just move all the replicas at once, there's going to be so much data being moved at one point that your, your users will feel the impact on their latency or, or their throughput. Uh, so uh, let's just say that the, the, approval, the proposal we see here looks good. We're going to approve it. And now Strimzy will start rebalancing the, 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 the Kafka cluster. And we can see here rebalancing is, is true. Then we wait a little bit, and if the force is with us, we will see that the that there is now balance, and and uh, the the Kafka um, rebalance ha has successfully completed. Now, um, thinking back to the quotas we were talking about earlier, cluster wide quotas um, in the rebalance process. During the rebalance process, not all of the replicas are actually moved over, uh, and that means we still have an imbalanced cluster, which means what we do. Uh, on the little horse side is we over provision the quotas that we give to to our clients before the rebalance is while the rebalance is in process because uh we don't know for sure that all the the, the replicas are on the new cluster but once the the rebalance is is now uh, completed by the ready true condition on the status we are able to reduce the quotas to what we would have uh, given the new number of brokers um so we do have time for some closing notes, which are uh, basically on how do you create these custom resources, the, the Kafka topic and Kafka users especially, and then the Kafka rebalance, which is a bit more of a special uh, one. So um, there's a couple options. Uh, you can have basically, you know, one option is the completely um, uh, low level, just allow uh, every microservice developer team to create a Kafka topic or Kafka user as they wish using basically kubectl, or perhaps there's just a, a directory in the, the microservice repository in, in Git where the, the pipeline will kubectl apply everything in there, right? That's that's a little bit like the Wild West. Um, another way you could do it is you could have a centralized repository 
a centralized Git repository managed by your infrastructure team with pull requests and such. So if a, if a microservice developer wants to create a Kafka topic, uh, he or she will open a pull request to create a Kafka topic custom resource in that centralized repository, right? Uh, that's nice because now you can have a grumpy maintainer of your uh, organization's Kafka cluster who will reject things that don't make sense. But it's also a problem because um, it's the, the, there's a little bit more friction to, to getting everything to work. Um, but, uh, you know, on, on the flip side, uh, it's very easy to see uh, who has access to what all in one place. And then the third option is, is you could go, your platform team could go the extra mile and build like a self-service system with, with guardrails that really depends on the context of the organization. So for example, you could have a, a, a you could create a, a YAML file or um, uh, something with your own specific schema that, or a Helm chart that deploys each microservice. And there might be a values field in the Helm chart, which is a list of Kafka topic uh, names with partitions and replication factor that you need to create. And then your pipeline could validate that you don't create any Kafka topics that um, are outside of your, your prefix scope, for example. Uh, but the problem with that is that's a lot of work for your platform team to accomplish. Um, and then lastly, what we actually do is a fancy Kubernetes operator. So this is what we do uh, in Little Horse. We actually have a Kubernetes operator that runs Little Horse for you. Uh, and uh, what that does is that Kubernetes operator creates all of the Kafka topic custom resources and the Kafka user custom resource needed for that um, little horse cluster. And it also does a really cool thing. Uh, don't have time to go into it today, but it it basically has declarative scaling of the the Kafka cluster uh, using the uh, Kafka rebalance CRD. So when we add, if you uh, we have an LH Kafka custom resource, which is basically a super thin wrapper over Shrimzy. But every time you change the number of replicas, it will do two things, which is scale the Kafka node pool and then create a Kafka rebalance and then uh, wait for the rebalance to, con to complete and then update the quotas of all of the Kafka users once the rebalance has been completed. Now, you know, we're, we're unfortunately unable to make that open source because it's so specific to our use case at Little Horse. But I just wanted to mention it because it's a it's a pattern that you can use if you have a lot of resources and Kubernetes operator expertise and you, you don't really want to do the Wild West, you don't want a centralized repository, and, and maybe you want to go a little bit further than having a self-service uh, setup with, with some guardrails. So that said, uh, I'd like to really say thank you to a couple of people. So first of all, the Strimsy contributors and community, like it's a small team, but it's absolutely incredible how, how much and how quickly uh, features are released and, and how clean the API is. Um, for our, our own internal operator, generally, when we're not sure how to do something, what we do is we look at the Strimzy API and try to say, okay, is there anything we can learn from Strimzy before we actually add that feature to Little Horse? So I've just learned a lot about how Kafka works, learned a lot about good API design just from using Strimzy. So I want to say thanks to the Strimzy team. Uh, also, thanks to my team at Little Horse. Um, a lot of people were involved in making this possible. Uh, Saul, Mateo, Mihail, Edu, um, Ali. All of you guys really helped uh, with, with some of the ideas for this. And there's a bunch of other ones I couldn't mention. And thank you guys for watching. And also, um, you know, uh, I'm wearing the Sun Microsystems shirt. I want to say, uh, I, don't know, I don't think he's watching, but thanks to my dad for making it possible to, to work on this Little Horse project. So uh, with that said, I'll, uh, Kate, if you could help with any of the, I don't know how the Q&A process would work, but happy to take some questions now if we have two minutes. Yeah, of course. Thank you very much, Cole. That was a, definitely a really interesting session. Um, <clears throat> we do have a couple of questions. So the first one was, um, so this was asked towards the beginning when we were talking about the mutual TLS connection between brokers. Um, the question was, can we use service mesh like Istio instead of the Strimzy provide the mutual TLS as most of them use service mesh like Istio for pod to pod? Okay, that's a fantastic question. The answer is, Kind of, um, you know, when when there is Zookeeper is unfortunately incompatible with with Istio. I, I tried it once, and uh, the the Envoy proxy doesn't really like to work with the Zookeeper pods. But now that there's Craft, you can technically actually run little or not little words. You can actually run Kafka uh, on Shrimzy with uh, Istio. However, uh, the the thing is that. Um, Strimzy, there's not really a way to disable the, the encryption, so you'd have double communication or double encryption, which is a little bit of overhead that you don't want. And also, Istio doesn't have any Kafka features. So the Envoy proxy, there is a like a kind of an abandoned Kafka filter that doesn't really do very much. So you couldn't do anything like enforcing ACLs and such uh, using Istio, unfortunately. 
Thanks. Um, there is, I guess, this the future external cert manager integration might help with being able to disable, but I don't know. We're not sure if that's actually going to be a feature we'll offer or not yet. Actually, I was talking with a friend yesterday who also uses StreamC, and that feature request came up. So okay, interesting. Which is disabling it specifically for yes. Istio. <laughs> Um, and so then we'll do one more question um, and then there's one more that I'll get you to answer um, in text. But the other live question we'll do is, is Cruise Control aware of which topics is owned by which tenant? If not, how do you prevent Cruise Control suggesting a rebalance that will potentially compromise your data throughput NFRs? Um, I'm not sure what NFR stands for, but I think I understand the question. Yeah, I'm not sure what it stands for. Uh, well, so you, you can pass in a list of excluded topics or included topics. So basically, you can use a regex to control what topics are affected by the, the rebalance. Uh, however, we haven't really considered that to be necessary because the in our case, the number of partitions for our topic, because it's a Kafka Streams application, we have a lot because we want to limit the amount of data that's in each RoxDB instance. So we'll have like, you know, 128 partitions per topic. And if we only have like up to a couple dozen brokers, we just rebalance all the topics over all the brokers. It's not really a problem. Uh, so we don't necessarily need to make cruise control tenant aware. We haven't had that problem. Uh, so hope that answers the question. And then there's one more in the chat, but if you can jump in the chat after we finish and um, yeah, okay. there's so, um, NFR non-functional requirement. <laughs> Non functional <laughs> requirement. Okay. <laughs> uh, I think I answered the question anyway. So cool. But yeah, we'll, we'll leave this session here. So thank you very much, Colt. And yeah, our next session is going to be support tiered storage in Strimsy operated Kafka um, in 10 minutes. Can't wait to watch that one.